I'm Dr. Dolores Jones Brown from the Department of Law, Police Science, and Criminal Justice Administration, and the founding director of the Center on Race, Crime, and Justice. I am thrilled with the department or the office of the provost to have this opportunity to bring Dr. Jeff Ward to campus today. And before we hear from Jeff, we're going to hear from our president, Travis, to talk about bringing you greetings. So this is both easy and brief. Greetings. Um, a little bit longer, which is I'm delighted that Jeff has come to uh, give uh, a lecture to us uh, this afternoon. Uh, he and I met uh, in very interesting circumstances in Washington a couple months ago, and I said, uh, come here, come talk to our folks. Uh, and as you'll see, uh, I think he's one of the rising star scholars uh, in his field. He comes to us from UC Irvine, um, which is uh, certainly a high quality, prestigious institution, but has a very eclectic uh, sort of intellectual range of uh, scholarly interest uh, that bring him mostly around issues of race. And that's why we're here, and that's something we think about a lot at John Jay. And so we're delighted, Jeff, that you've come. And the microphone is yours. And I've already apologized to him and Dolores that I have to leave midway through. So no offense intended, just busy schedules. You're going to do the longer introduction? There we go. Okay. This is going to be the, the speed introduction, given the little bit of time that we have. Uh, Dr. Jeff Ward is a native of Los Angeles. He holds a degree in sociology from Hampton University and the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. The BA is from Hampton. The PhD is from the University of Michigan. He, was published, he has published on diverse topics relating to race and social organization, including skin tone stratification and black intellectual history. Um, his current research and teaching focuses on the intersections of race, crime and justice, including the racialization of juvenile justice, race and representation in justice administration. He also studies the collateral consequences of criminal justice policy. Uh, Dr. Ward was a, I think it may be the only the second Mellon postdoctoral fellow um, from the Vera Institute back when there was a race and justice fellowship that was sponsored by Mellon. Um, he was also coordinator of the Africana Criminal Justice Project at Columbia University's Institute for Research in African American Studies under Dr. Manny Marable, the late Dr. Manny Marable. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society at the University of California, Irvine, and his award-winning book, The Black Child Savers, Racial Democracy and Juvenile Justice, actually won two National Book Awards. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jeff. We're happy to have you come to speak with us. Thank you so much uh, for the introductions and for all of you um, using your community hour uh, to be here with me. Um, it's it's, a, it's uh, a pleasure to have been invited by President Travis to come uh, spend some time at John Jay, learn more about the, the college and the exciting things going on here. Um, my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Henry Pontel, was recently lured away from our department uh, in Irvine by this beautiful weather. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, there, there's a sort of a slow procession perhaps. Eventually, uh, all of Irvine will be wanting to be here uh, in this space with you all. I'm a little bit, I'm adjusting to some recent information that I will not be able to project my carefully curated imagery uh, and uh, um, my, my um, uh, uh, the transitions I was anticipating you having before your eyes are going to solely depend now on me and my rhetorical ability. So uh, bear with me if some of these uh, progression of this talk seems awkward. It is because uh, 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 Imagine you're, we're all blind for the next 30, sort of 40 minutes, and maybe you could even close your eyes, actually, if you'd like. Um, what I want to talk, to do, talk about today is my current project on the legacy of historical racial violence. In a speech exactly 50 years ago, March 25th, 1965, at the conclusion of the march from Selma to Montgomery, Martin Luther King famously addressed this question of how long the freedom movement would take. Um, how long will we have to wait? And he memorably answered, 
quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Uh, the title of my talk is The Long Arc of Racial Violence, and it's a play on that comment, uh, in part because as a political commentator, Chris Weigand recently observed, for many, King's phrase seems to have been an invitation to inaction. If the arc is gonna bend towards justice, why not just wait it out? Um, and what we know, though, from uh, current research uh, that I've been involved with that I'm going to talk about today, uh, the arc of racial violence is long, and it bends towards more racial violence, at least in the absence of intentional intervention. So what I want to talk about today is uh, the project I've been involved with, which attempts to both understand that arc and what sustains it, how is it that racial violence, centuries old, continues to manifest in the same places, and what might bend that arc more quickly towards what we might call racial justice? So imagine for a moment that you grew up in, maybe some of you did, communities where you regularly encountered signs like um, white only, or uh, the sign I was going to show you uh, today was a picture of three bathroom doors. One said women, one says men, and one said color. And you would pass by these doors, maybe use them occasionally over many years. Maybe you'd see them if you were in the South, they'd be ubiquitous. Um, how would this impact your sense of self and others? This is a relatively unspectacular form of racial violence uh, in, compared to, in comparison to something like lynching. But it is a form of, stru of structural violence nonetheless. And one of its likely impacts, unspectacular but devastating, is the differential valuation of human life. There are men, there are women, and there are colored people. To borrow a phrase from our contemporary situation, you would likely develop a racial schema that says black lives matter less. And that idea might rationalize behavior, including all kinds of discrimination and exclusion, um, and including inter and intraracial violence. It is unclear how that relationship, how long that relationship would last, or what might bring it to an end, but a growing body of work focused predominantly on the legacy of lynching. I believe some of you have these images uh, with you. Now, a growing body of work focused on the legacy of lynching is giving us some insight into uh, how we should understand the impacts and legacies of these kinds of experiences. Lynchings are, of course, more spectacular moments of racial socialization. And it is becoming clear that while the era of lynching may have ended, and I said, I had originally written has ended, and then I had to correct that because we are just today in the midst of two, at least two incidents of uh, suspicious hangings of African-American men in Mississippi and North Carolina over the last month. Uh, but while certainly the era of lynching as it existed at its height has ended, the effects of lynching have not. Let me tell you a story about a place that I think captures this um, uh, uh, complexity and urgency of the question of legacy very well. Uh, the image some of you see of this wooded grounds uh, comes from Mariana, Florida, uh, a place that was once called the Arthur G. Dozier School for Boys. It was once the largest reformatory in the United States, and it helps to illustrate the continuity of racial violence over time. Uh, Recently, 50 bodies were discovered in unmarked graves on these grounds uh, in what was the colored section of the reformatory. Now, the reformatory opened in 1900 and only closed around the end of the 20th century. Um, but by all indications, Jackson County, where the city of Mariana is located, was already distinguished by a long, violent history, a normative uh, sort of uh, uh, reality of racial violence, tracing back at least to what was called the Jackson County War of 1869 to 1971, which was really a war as part of the uh, 
backlash on uh, uh, emancipation where segregationists, including the earliest, some of the earliest Klan and other white supremacist organizations mobilized to reclaim Jackson County as a white supremacist stronghold. Um, and it, would, it arose at, from that moment as a, as, uh, as a site of entrenched uh, white supremacism and associated violence. Media reports today stress that Mariana was always a bastion of white supremacism, culturally and institutionally, bent on maintaining what the historian Douglas Blackman called slavery by another name when the state reform school opened for business in 1900, and it succeeded in doing so. All kids who were confined at Dozier appeared to have suffered physical, sexual, psychological abuse while in that institution. But the suffering, the exploitation, the violence uh, was much greater for those black youth confined uh, in the black section of that long segregated institution. A survivor put it succinctly when he said that, quote, the black side was the slave side. And I could go on about this history of Jim Crow juvenile justice and what that means uh, uh, to describe this as the slave side, but I'm gonna move on just to stress that uh, this, this, uh, that this reformatory was built on what were already um, polluted grounds in terms of racial ethnic group relations. And it's not surprising that that um, soil, that toxic soil seeped into the institutional policies and practices of the, of, of the reformatory that was built there and became one of the largest in the United States. In fact, in the same year the institution was established, in June uh, 1900, uh, a year also where Congress refused to pass legislation uh, addressing the issue of lynching, a man named Nathaniel Bellamer was lynched in Jackson County uh, near the site of the reformatory for what was reported as, quote, no offense. The town of Mariana is perhaps best known in terms of the lynching literature for the infamous 1934 lynching of Claude Neal. In that case, white children were allegedly given sharpened sticks to use in mutilating Neal's body as it was hauled around town after his lynching. Now, it seems likely that some number of the adult and child participants in this festival of violence, this sadistic festival of violence, would go on to, would either already have some connection to the Dozier School or would go on to have some connection later in their life. And that the cultural and institutional supports for that sadistic violence and the Neil lynching would manifest in other ways behind the walls of Dozier. A Dozier survivor who suffered its violence concluded that, quote, the boys were doomed by a long chain of bloody history before they even arrived. Even now, with the institution finally closed under pressure from the federal government, the influences clearly endure. Closing the reform school has the appearance of shuttering its history, but underlying cultural and institutional structures are not so easily removed. The fertile soil that gave rise to Dozier and sustained it for over a century has been disturbed by these recent developments, but having been cultivated for so long, some of its features must remain and threaten to sprout violence anew, whether as hate crime or as anti-immigrant sentiment or as draconian and discriminatory crime control practices and so on. A former Dozier official who was recently teaching in middle school reportedly taught his students that President Obama's campaign slogan, Change, stood for, quote, can you help a nigger get elected? He was disciplined and then transferred to another educational department in Jackson County. So this is a story, I think, that encapsulates, it perhaps is an extreme story in the sense of the institutionalized violence in that particular community. But one of the things that makes it extreme is that it's one of the cases we know a lot about there are probably similar stories elsewhere in this country, and research on the legacy of historical racial violence is beginning to make those stories known. 
what I've been very interested in, in terms of my own research recently, and, in, um, and more generally in terms of some of my previous work, including the work uh, mentioned on the black child savers, is how we should understand the endurance of uh, racial violence and the legacy of its harm. In the case of Jim Crow juvenile justice, the black child savers I wrote about in that book regarded separate and unequal juvenile justice as a form of genocide, a slow genocide that was affected by killing the seeds of a people, as one of these reformers described the underdevelopment of black youth systematically. They weren't lynched and killed in some spectacular, horrifying moment, but rather deprived of, 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 the, of the educational and, and emotional and physical supports that would ensure the realization of their f full human potential. And so by killing them slowly, the whole group was underdeveloped. The recent research on this question of historical transmission or how it is that events in the seemingly distant past remain relevant today have identified a number of uh, connections between historic lynchings and contemporary outcomes. I list several of these in um, uh, one of these slides. These include contemporary patterns of hate crime, contemporary patterns of hate crime law enforcement. Um, so where there were large numbers of lynchings in the past, there are both um, larger, uh, uh, there are both higher rates of hate crime today and lower rates of hate crime law enforcement today. There are, uh, there's greater support for capital punishment. There's greater white supremacist mobilization. I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment. And um, there are apparently effects on homicide rates. How is this possible? As one reviewer of a recent journal article we finally got published said, uh, why should we believe that, the that lynching has anything to do with contemporary uh, uh, dynamics? And there are really three mechanisms that appear to stand out theoretically in terms of understanding this transmission over time. Um, one is uh, that these represent moments of extreme racial socialization. The, uh, the late great black historian John Hope Franklin referred to these as uh, moments of a sort of baptismal introduction into the norms of white supremacism. And if you think about some of these images you might have seen of lynching, Families took pride in bringing their small children to witness them, uh, to convey to them both who they were as white people and who black people were um, in relation to white people. Um, and so those moments of extreme racial socialization we would expect to endure over the life courses of those who experienced these moments. I might add here that if you lived in a community where black life was systematically devalued, you even if you were black, you might too internalize that idea such that homicide rates among African Americans may be higher today in communities in part because of a long history of the devaluation of black life and the lack of legal recourse in cases where people take black lives. A, uh, another mechanism that seems uh, apparent is that these are moments when the culture is conveying its support for violence as a means of resolving dispute. You all know, I've heard a lot about cultures of violence and the cultural sort of um, um, dimensions of violence, so this isn't um, a very radical idea, but clearly these are moments of cultural socialization as violence itself goes, and so there are moments where racial violence in particular is uh, um, uh, rationalized and sustained. And finally, um, the loss of community cohesion in a community uh, 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 racked by terroristic activity, uh, some kinds of cohesion may be intensified, particularly within racial ethnic group, uh, sort of racially ethnically defined community context. Uh, but the likelihood that people identify with each other across racial lines in these communities uh, seems to be unlikely. So I sort of following on this fascinating literature that um, was primarily driven initially by lynching scholars um, and sociologists who, who used the historiography of lynching to develop new kinds of research, I became interested in this question of uh, 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 this gap that exists in this literature 
there's a there's a there's a sort of illusion that with the decline of lynching, um, uh, racial terror itself declined. Uh, and in fact, we know that's not the case. We know that when, by the time, I think 1940 was the first year that went by with no lynchings. Um, now, we know that from 1940 to 1970, it was an incredibly racially violent period. Lynchings declined, but other kinds of racial terror emerged in its wake. The Mississippi burning case, uh, uh, where uh, uh, Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney were found uh, murdered, activists in Mississippi found murdered uh, by the Klan with complicity of state actors is a well-known case. But there are numerous incidents, cross burnings, beatings of activists, reprisals, and so forth, that um, share some of the functional, have a sort of functional equivalency with lynching in terms of the mechanisms I described. These are other moments of extreme racial socialization, of culturally supported violence, moments where community social cohesion is likely to decline. So I became interested in filling this historical gap by collecting data on these incidents, these incidents of racial terror in the mid 20th century, after the decline of lynching up to around the period of 19, the, 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 up until the end of the 1970s. Um, under the belief that if the legacy of lynching is in fact real, we should see it travel through these mid-century events as well, and perhaps be sustained by those mid-century events. So over the last couple of years, I've been working with colleagues in Mississippi and North Carolina and at universities across the country to develop an original database on civil rights era racial violence that can be used to look at this question empirically, but as I'll get to in a moment, can also be used to engage stakeholders in the process of, 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 of uh, reconciling uh, this history, of acknowledging it and reconciling uh, this history of, in, a, in a sort of transitional justice process. I'm going to say a little bit about this research, and then I'll talk more about the, um, uh, 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 the, the engagement work that I find very exciting around all of this. Um, one of the maps you may see, I don't know, I don't know if everyone has this uh, handout or not, is um, um, a, a representation of Ku Klux Klan rally activity in North Carolina in 1963, the state police recorded the license plates of cars parked at Klan rallies. And we used that data to determine where these attendees at these rallies came from. And as this buffer map from North Carolina shows you, and we have a number of rallies we looked at analytically, I'm just showing you one of these. Uh, and this is an article that's forthcoming in Social Problems. We looked at uh, the, uh, the conditions that gave rise to Klan mobilization in certain counties. Why were some counties able to marshal thousands of people at Klan rallies and other people, other counties not? To what extent is this driven by uh, conditions of racial ethnic competition, economic or political? To what extent is it a story of the legacy of lynching? What's explaining these patterns? And what is it about this anomaly? If you look at this buffer map, most of the people attending these rallies, all the maps look the same, come from the immediate area. And you get these outliers who are coming from hundreds of miles away to attend these rallies. What's going on with those folks? Um, and so we looked at this analytically um, using a, an interesting analytic technique called um, qualitative comparative analysis and found that, in fact, there are multiple configurations of conditions that gave rise to Klan mobilization. We looked at rallies. We also looked at the formation of Klan chapters. Um, one of those uh, configurations, um, a couple of them involve strong legacies of racial violence, usually not in isolation. So typically a story about a combination of factors present in a community, um, the present of, presence of a large population of African Americans, the recent formation of an NAACP chapter, these are forms of demographic and political threat, uh, com competition in the labor market, 
the, the, the availability of local resources, so neighboring claverns in nearby counties, um, and authority work. And the story about these outlier cars, and we don't really know, I mean, it, I could go off, I could go on a tangent about this. I find this, this, this uh, license plate data fascinating. Uh, you know, is this, a, is this a small sedan or a bus? You know, we don't really know. But, um, uh, but, 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 but a big part of what explains these outlier people coming from hundreds of miles away to attend these rallies throughout the state is the role of authority work. Um, the Rowan County cluster where these people are coming from, from a distance, is where the old clan in North Carolina had a stronghold and was, uh, and, and so those adherents were invested in, uh, in kind of whipping up their white uh, 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 fellow citizens into a frenzy all around the state to, to establish and sustain the new clan in North Carolina. So they would go to these rallies, they would stage the rallies in far-flung places and say, haven't you noticed the new NAACP chapter and aren't you feeling threatened? Uh, people say, oh yeah, now that you mention it. <laughs> um, don't you think we should burn some crosses here tonight? Well, that's probably a good idea. Uh, and so we, we have this idea about these uh, spaces as being kind of isolated. You know, this is, a, this is a county with a long history of racial violence. But what, what this research is pointing out is that the, con is that the relationships are more complex. There's this, uh, there's this effect of proximity to organizing activity in nearby counties. Um, this, has been, this has been illustrated in the work of sociologists who are looking at urban crime. Uh, you know, the, the, the proximity to neighboring communities uh, that have high rates of crime uh, is enough to, to affect the sort of social milieu of a community that doesn't seem to present those criminogenic factors. So it's not a um, necessarily um, uh, um, a novel discovery, but in terms of understanding the legacy of lynching, it points out that these legacies travel. Um, one of the maps I've been working with students at UC Irvine, and, and I should mention here, I'm going to say this a bit more further, I'm going to say more about this later, but all this work has been largely student-driven, uh, undergraduate research assistants, dozens of whom have worked with me in populating this database, I've been working with students in GIS mapping classes to map the data. One of my favorite recent maps, I didn't present it today, overlays railway stations with historical incidents of racial violence to get a sense of how this violence likely traveled as populations migrated out of the South through places like St. Louis uh, on their way to Chicago or on their way east and west uh, in that uh, way station. Um, um, so as I mentioned, uh, let me make one last point about the Klan. The, um, we see in this paper I just mentioned that historic lynching predicts Klan activity we also know that homicide rates are greater. Uh, my collaborator, David Cunningham, and his colleague, Rory McVeigh, have recently published a piece showing that homicide rates align to counties with histories of uh, contemporary homicide rates with histories of, of Klan mobilization in the mid-20th century. So there was already some indication from those disparate pieces of research that the mid-20th century was an important sort of way station for the enduring significance of, historic, of, of, of racial violence tracing back farther in time. And what we've been doing in this project that I'll describe later as the Racial Violence Archive is collecting more events on these incidents of reprisal, intimidation, and violence um, that scarred these communities in that period beatings of activists, as this portrayal of uh, this image, I don't know if you can make out, some of you have it, a woman crossing the street who's probably participating in a nonviolent protest, and this man about to club her uh, with a bat. Um, uh, as all these folks look on, we've been trying to document these moments, and you can imagine how difficult that has been, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But this too is a moment of extreme racial socialization, of a, an expression of culturally supported violence that likely undermines the development of community. 
So we've taken these data, um, which number now, we were funded, I should mention, by the National Science Foundation a couple years ago um, to conduct a study of anti-civil rights enforcement events or these violent events in the civil rights movement era and um, to, uh, to study how they're organized and their significance. And my primary role in that study was to, was to, to build this database of um, civil rights era racial violence Focusing initially on Mississippi and North Carolina, the project has since expanded to include other states in a, in a broader period of time. My research team, mostly comprised of undergraduate students who worked with me as, uh, as in, in independent study, uh, combed through primary and secondary sources to identify these events. And we have now a record of at least 3,000 events from just these uh, uh, most of them from Mississippi and North Carolina. We're only, we haven't even begun to look at Alabama or Georgia. We're just getting into Florida and Louisiana. Thomas Jefferson famously remarked, I don't know how famous it is, but I'm going to repeat it. Uh, he feared uh, emancipation because the formerly enslaved have 10,000 recollections of the crimes committed against them. We just take that 10,000 figure as a ballpark. I think it's low. A low estimate, um, but we only we've so far identified 3,000 discrete events from just a handful of states in a relatively short period of time. Um, and what we found in uh, in uh, the first analysis of these data that will be coming out that's uh, just published recently in Race and Justice is that. Uh, Civil rights movement era violence is more likely in eras in areas with histories of lynching, and contemporary interracial homicide is more likely is uh, rates of interracial homicide, which is a relatively rare event, um, are are higher in areas uh, uh, with histories of both lynching and civil rights movement era violence. This is um, these are statistically significant effects. I'm not getting into all the technical details about it. We actually find a statistically significant mediating effect for overall homicide rates. That is, the effect of lynching on contemporary lethal violence, specifically homicide, works through its prior effect on civil rights movement era violence. So we find empirical evidence that um, uh, civil rights movement era violence essentially sustains the environmental impacts of historic lynchings, contributing then to contemporary lethal violence. This is on one level very discouraging um, in the sense of its uh, portrayal of the depth of the problem before us. But I think it's also encouraging in the sense that um, there are indications that we will be able to empirically identify what we might call hot spots of historical racial violence places where we can reasonably anticipate present and future conflict that will result in, uh, uh, it will result in racial violence, whether it's interpersonal or in nature, structural in nature, or, or what have you. And insofar as we can do that, we can be more strategic in terms of our research, educational, and remedial efforts as far as bending that arc uh, towards justice goes. Let me close by um, talking more about the, what I find that, that sort of, what I'm especially excited about now, um, which is this um, uh, partnership with colleagues in Mississippi and other parts of the South in, um, in an engaged research project around the, um, um, my racial violence archive. So I've been working with students, I mentioned before, across disciplines, mostly in information and computer science and in my own school of social ecology, to both document these events, but also to develop an interactive web-based interface by which we can make these data more available to a broader community of stakeholders, rather than leaving them confined to academic publications. And we can engage the public in the actual process of documenting and analyzing uh, um, these events. And that involvement is crucial because of the particular nature of this uh, kind of data. The project essentially constitutes an example of action research. 
And that term may not be familiar, although I know there are some folks here at John Jay who are engaged in participatory action research, and so you know exactly what it is. But some of you may not be familiar with it, notwithstanding its deep roots in the city of New York. In essence, by action research, I mean research intended to both contribute um, to addressing practical concerns of people experiencing social problems and to further the theoretical empirical goals of social science research simultaneously. Um, uh, in effect, to engage research and communities collect uh, together in the solution of our common problems. So I've been working with these folks to develop this racial violence archive in a way that makes it a resource for action research. I'll just highlight a few features. I was hoping to be able to demonstrate these. Um, uh, it's kind of I ironic. I mean, it's like a technology tool that I've developed, and I'm up here with no technology, <laughs> except for this microphone. I should throw down the mic or something. Be, you know, uh, <laughs> just go no technology. But um, uh, so we developed a tool whereby. Um, an interested user, that could be a resident of the Mississippi Delta who's trying to organize community to talk about these issues, um, a researcher, uh, a teacher, um, can access our record of, in, of, of, of events and, and also uh, contribute event data that we cannot access through the traditional resources that research scholars use to generate data. Um, this is a peculiar kind of data in that legal officials were often complicit in the events themselves, police officers, either through their actions or inactions, uh, courts uh, through their actions and inactions, um, newspapers um, through their non-documentation of these events. And so we've kind of already accessed the low-hanging fruit, the published sources, the case studies of, of the movement in different places. The vast majority of the data, though, is trapped in people's stories. They're in um, the memories, uh, the collective memories of families and communities. And we wanted to create a tool that would allow someone to go into our database and identify uh, its limitations, to search their home county and say, how can there possibly be only 12 events from this community? I know of twice as many myself. And instead of becoming frustrated with this and writing it off as the work of uh, naive ivory tower academics, they can click on this button that says submit and provide a narrative, provide event details, upload a photo, a copy of a letter, uh, a newspaper clipping that they have, uh, a recording that they made with their grandmother where she told a story. And we'll take that material review it, try to cross-reference it with other material to get a sense of its pl plausibility, and use it essentially to crowdsource data for this project, but also in the process. Um, uh, well, I want to stress two parts of this. One is that it's creating a different kind of knowledge stream than is common in social science research, where the knowledge, instead of going out from academia, is coming in from communities. Uh, where knowledge about these, material, this, this, these events is greater than what we have. Uh, but the other part that's very powerful to me is that by engaging people actively in the documentation of these events and the reflection of their, on their significance, um, in the visualization of the data using mapping applications and so forth, uh, timeline functions, really getting them to reflect on the meaning of this history in a way that Tri tri typical social science work often fails to do. I'll give you one example of this kind of practical utility from an educational perspective. The state of Mississippi recently passed legislation requiring K through 12 education on the racial violence in that state, the history of racial violence in that state. Teachers are now scrambling to figure out what are they going to do. And you can only show eyes on the prize so many times. Uh, <laughs> You know, you could take your students and march over the Edmund Tedis Bridge a few times, maybe. But what are they really going to do? How are they going to engage their students, particularly students that aren't so interested in reading my book, for example, or some other book-length study of the movement in um, some particular community? Students might be more interested in accessing an interactive technology tool 
um, where they have a voice, where they can actually become a part of, an active participant in the research process. And, and so by partnering with my colleagues at the University of Mississippi, we're planning to have middle school students, high school students involved in local community studies where they expose the limitations of our data set but also address them through their own efforts. And in that process, we hope, they become energized as future civic leaders.